Um, for those of you who don't know me, I own some bars in Houston. I've opened about 10 places in Houston over the past decade. Um, I currently operate six different bars. Um, so for me, training is really, really important because it's how I get to live my life because it is impossible to be in six bars at once. Um, and when I started learning about cocktails, I was completely self-taught. When we opened Animal Bar and Refuge in 2009, I had never been to another modern cocktail bar. I just not happened to be able to go. And we opened this bar and we were short-staffed and we were really busy when we didn't expect people to buy cocktails in Houston and all of a sudden we found ourselves completely, totally fucked. Right? <laughs> Which I'm sure that we're all very familiar with this feeling. And over time we kind of pushed through and got a few people on board that were good staff members and had great staffs who moved through and I was working behind the bar every day and got to spend time with those people. A couple of those people are in the room right now. Y'all can tell you what it was like to work with me behind the bar and I would just yell at him all the time. And that was our form of training at the time. Right? I was like, don't do it like that. We talked about this yesterday. And then over time we wanted to do more things. We want to open more places and, and you know, we opened a beer bar after that, a restaurant and a coffee shop, then we opened a charity bar and several other cocktail bars. And it was impossible to be around all the time and make sure that our standards for what we wanted to do as a business were intact. Right? So over time we developed a more specific training program, which we'll talk about today. Um, but I think that most of you are probably here because you're expecting to see like some training program or some how-to manual about how we get people to make drinks the right way. And while that's going to be a component about what we're going to talk about today, what I really want you to do when you leave the room is to change how you think about what you should be providing your staff members in an educational sense, right? Because when we, when we talk about training, we tend to talk about how do we get someone to a position where they work behind the bar and they're able to take care of guests and they're able to make drinks in an efficient manner so that we can make money, right? And that's generally where training starts. And then it shortly stops thereafter because we're like, okay, you're good enough to be part of the team and you fit into this equilibrium, right? But in doing so, we really stopped helping people advance in their careers. And one thing that I think that is starting to happen in our specific community of the bar industry is that when we talk about professionalism and we talk about marketing and becoming a career, we're not really living that message out entirely, especially on the ownership side, in terms of what type of benefits we provide our employees and then what type of training and education. I always tell our staff that if you reach a point with us where you're not learning anything, it's time for you to leave, right? So I feel that my responsibility as an owner all the time is to not just provide a job and a place for people to come to work, but instead to provide a learning experience where they can continue to grow. Because if they're not getting something out of me that's, that's in addition to what we offer them in terms of financial compensation, I really don't know why they're working at a cocktail bar and they can just go work at a nightclub and make more money, right? Which a lot of people do. I love working at nightclubs. I miss it all the time. Right? But it's not, it's not why they've chosen this part of the industry. They're engaged and interested in spirits and cocktails and the specific components of what we do. Right? And you're a fool if you don't think that your staff is going to leave you as soon as possible if you're not educating them in a certain way. Right? They're going to go take that brand ambassador job. They're going to move up to whatever beverage director position is offered to them next, even if they're not qualified and ready for it. Right? So it affects retention, it affects the type of career they're going to have in the future, and it's your chance to have a mark on these people and change like what their lives are actually like and what they're capable of in the future. So for us, when we talk about training and when we create training programs for our cars, what we're trying to do is we're trying to teach someone what it is like to be what we expect out of a bar professional. Right? That's our goal. So yes, we're going to talk today about how to train bartenders. But really what we're, what we're trying to do is train bar professionals. We always say that we don't train bartenders at our bars, we train bar owners. And that's a big reason why people come work for us. But it's that long-term view that I'd really like everybody to walk away with today and to think about when it comes to training, it's something that really should never end until that person leaves your bar. Cool? All right. So let's get started. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there's nobody left to hire. Like, there, there's nobody left to hire. The brands are taking them all, they're going to work as ambassadors, they're moving on to beverage director positions, there's just no one left to hire. And there is so much demand for cocktail bartenders in the United States right now, and I think it's a lot larger than what we think. Like, when we think of cocktail bars, we think of the people that we run into when we go to conferences, the people that people tell us we should go see when we, like, ask for recommendations for bars in New York, right? And there are so many places that identify as cocktail bars, and those people are, that, that are working in those places are interested in the cocktail movement specifically. So this is just some data that kind of shows what that actually looks like, right? This is, this is the most recent poll and survey of this. There are 393,000 people that are employed in the 
combined to feed the United States. And of that total population, 11.5% are estimated to work at Mars that are self-identified as cocktail bars, meaning that nationwide, 45,000 cocktail bartenders are out there. How are these people learning how to make cocktails, and what is their interest in this specific market? Because when they're choosing this specific market, they're generally doing it because of some creative sense and some desire for education. Right? So what type of training programs exist? I was actually, when I was, when I was working on the seminar, going to poll a lot of people and try and find out what their training programs look like. And it was such a, a disorganized question to even ask bars around the country that I really like. Where people were like, well, we kind of do this, and then we work in this way, and then we, they work five shifts before we actually let them step behind the bar. And I was just kind of dumbfounded by the lack of structure across the board as it relates to training programs. And there's this huge pool of people out there that are interested in this type of information, but we haven't structured what we're giving them in the right way. Specifically, if you work in bars in the West, one enormous challenge for you is that you work in a culture that's, that really isn't oriented towards hospitality. So I have a master's in intercultural communication that I don't use, and I really wanted to include part of that in this slide. <laughs> so that's where this comes from, right? But it's Jared Hofstede. He was this guy that basically started doing quantitative analysis about different cultural components in countries all around the world. His work is like the basics of where you start when it comes to intercultural communication. So basically, for the purposes of this discussion, we're looking at the, the variance between individualism and collectivism. If you're interested about the other axis, that's uncertainty regulations. So in Japan, they really don't like uncertainty. In other countries, they're okay with it. Right? But if we look at this, basically, the UK just barely beats us out as being bearded assholes, right? Um, <laughs> Australia, Australia as well, right? But it's, we're not oriented to take care of people, right? So if you're working in bars in westernized countries, specifically these countries, the people that you're likely interviewing are people that when their thought processes occur are about themselves. They're not about others. And you can see this if you've been lucky enough to travel. If you've never been to Japan, it should be your first trip as a hospitality professional abroad. I really feel that because when you go to Japan, you just leave and you're like, oh, I suck at my job. <laughs> I'm just really bad at like, making people feel warm and welcome. But the, the gap that you feel when you travel to other places and other cultures and you have service experience is this gap that we're talking about right here. And, and those have different personalities and they have different flavors and that's what makes like different bars great in a lot of ways. But it also points out that when we're dealing with American bartenders and we're trying to teach them to be hospitable and we're trying to think, teach them to think about others, it's kind of a struggle. It doesn't always happen immediately. And I think that this has become more problematic in recent years because people see bartending as something that can highlight themselves instead of something that can serve others. Right? What's happened with bartending over the past decade where people are more excited about how many Instagram followers they have Right? and whether they can travel on whatever trip, it's just feeding this mentality more and more, and it's causing people to go, okay, great, well, these are the satisfactions and the gratifications that I get out of being a bartender, right? And it further pushes people in that direction, right? Which is kind of sad, but it's also just the truth, and it doesn't do us anything to ignore that this is something that's happening, and that these are things that people are thinking when they apply for us. And it also doesn't make them potentially bad bartenders. Right? At all. If that's the reason why you chose to apply at one of our bars, you're never going to tell me that in the interview. I probably won't know. Right? And frankly, it doesn't matter because I need to take you as an employee, determine that you're a qualified applicant, and then teach you how we would handle those things in our bars. And as long as you do that, I'm fine. And then hopefully through the education process, you grow and evolve, and maybe you become somewhere more in the middle on this dot personally, even though you may not be part of the culture around you that supports those, those ideas. Okay. So, these are basic goals of our training that I think that people think of currently, right? So when, when people are like, okay, you know, I've got to train some bartenders, what are the things we're going to do? Right? We need to teach people how to make drinks the right way, learn about all the stuff that we sell, right? Some basic steps of service, how to handle money, where are the backup straws, how do we clean up this tiny bar, which varies tremendously from where we were, right? What happens when the POS crashes? Some stuff about Jerry Thomas that we feel compelled to tell people because they're working in a cocktail bar, right? And maybe, maybe you did some content in there about how to not sexually harass your coworkers, right? Maybe, maybe not all the time, but sometimes that goes in there, right? And this is pretty much what bar training looks like, even in like some of the best bars in the world, right? This is basically like, okay, cool, we've got to train this person to get all these things down, right? In the next like two to three weeks, and then we're just going to feed them to the wolves on a Friday night. And hopefully it's going to go well because we think this person has enough experience, right? Did anybody work in bars like this or run bars like this? I mean, that's how we opened all of our bars initially. It's not really a problem. It's just incomplete, 
right? And when people are like, well, I want to really improve my training program, I hear that you guys have a really good one in April. What does it look like? And I'm like, well, you know, it takes like nine months for someone to complete our training process, right? Um, there's 12 stages to it, blah, 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 blah. They're like, yeah, but what's it like at the beginning? Like, how do I do like it in three weeks? And I'm like, we well, just, you just want somebody to be able to make drinks and, and put them out so you can reach sales. That's, that's fine. That's not a training program. It's not an approach to training. Right? So these are basic things that happen. These are traditional methods of our training that exist currently. We've got the suffer approach. Then work your way up from a usually abusive bar back or certain position until the bartender finally quits. Right? At which point, there's massive amounts of infighting among the bar backs and bartenders. One of those people gets promoted and the other person likely quits at that point in time because they're upset that they didn't get the promotion. So then you have to hire a bar back and you probably don't have a training program for you. Right? We've got the angry veteran pairing. Work alongside colleagues that will definitely hate you for the first few months until you make things faster, which is never good for staff around. We've got the laminated recipe sheet with your own on a source of training program, where you call your managers if you have any problems because it'll probably be slower on Mondays and Tuesdays, right? But isn't it crazy that this isn't the worst because that person has a laminator, right? Instead of just giving you a sheet that's gonna like die in 30 minutes because you're spilling stuff everywhere. We've got the poacher. We loved you at your last job, and you just do the same sort of stuff over here now, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> right? Which I think is like how most cocktail bartenders are hiding. Right? And then we've got the full metal jacket. And as you're not sure you flash back to the it makes you wonder why you were excited about this job in the first place. Right? And this is typically the bar training program that is the most respected in our industry because people are like, we need you to do this. You can't work here unless it's like this. You need to know these things about the food ingredients. Like, is it vegan friendly? Is it blah, blah, And that's what people think a training program is. Right? But this is the stuff that I want you to walk away with today. Right? The more advanced goals of our team. First of all, we're trying to develop our professionals. Right? And what goes into that and everything that is a part of that is something that you can't put down on flashcards in a number of, of, of weeks. Right? The other part is that you need to convey the culture and creative identity of your bar. This is not something that exists on a recipe sheet, and it's probably not something that you can write down. Right? And it requires that you spend time with employees talking about the whys for why you do something in your bar. Right? We're going to cultivate contributing and engaged team members that will challenge your bar's norms. We need the people that are working in our bars to tell us when something is wrong or to tell us when something could be better. Right? And those suggestions are often really important training moments because it gets us to talk about the decisions for why we made certain things the way they are and then reconsider them at the same time. Right? And then we also want to enrich our community by recognizing that hospitality extends beyond our bar's walls. Okay? I don't think that it's possible for us to change Western notions of what hospitality looks like if we keep it in our bars solely. Right? I think that we need to teach people how to engage communities to consider things that are outside of the service process because we're ultimately trying to change people's mindsets about how they engage the world. And I think that makes more qualified hospitality professionals. Okay, so let's talk about the structured part of our training programs. At all of our bars now, um, with the exception of two, we have a 12-stage training process. Right? I used to kind of put this up on a slide and be like, these are the 12 stages, and then I was like, that's really boring. Right? So basically, we've got these different stages, and if you're an employee, every single week you have a chance to move past that stage, and you're expected to pursue passing that stage. Right? So in the first week, we've got really basic stuff, like here's your employee paperwork, here's a bar tour, right? here's the house cocktail recipes, here's some POS training, and every single one of those different steps has a, a, any written material that's associated with it, and then a sign-off page for someone who's a manager to sign off and show that you did that stuff. When you've completed all of those stages, you've completed training. Okay, has anybody been through a training program like this before? My first one was at McDonald's, and I still think that the training program at McDonald's is one of the best training programs I've ever been through. Really, your entire time that you're working at McDonald's, you're always able to opt in training, opt into training as you're able to, and then after you pass like certain amounts of training in different categories, you can get a raise and then be qualified to pick up shifts in other positions, right? Which was great because I was trying to pay for school. And they were okay with me working overtime because I was the only person that had passed different parts of training. And so I could work in the kitchen, or I could work the drive through window, whatever, right? But it also helped me become more informed about the other positions that were existing, right? So I constantly think about McDonald's training when I think about our bar training programs, right? But 
you'll go through these different stages and everything gets signed off if you've completed and then you move from stage one to stage two. Right? In stage two, we do different things like we make you read Danny Wire's book, right? And then we like give you cocktail recipes so that you're moving along more, and then we have you like stodge with other bartenders, right? We do the same thing through three and four at Animal, right? And so we feel like you're capable of taking a well to the degree that you won't totally create an imbalance in the tip. Right? And it usually takes like three to four stages for that to happen. We make that decision, but we also make training reflect that decision point in that process. So we're like, okay, this is happening, and at the end of stage four, we need you to be able to do these things, right? So that you become a contributing team member. Right? And then as time goes on, we do other stuff as well, right? So we'll start with those basic things, and then we'll do in depth spirits training. So then you're moving into different categories in every single stage. So there's a rum stage, a candy stage, a gin stage whiskey stage, a mezcal stage, and in each of those stages, you'll also do blind tests, or blind taste tests, where you have to taste eight different spirits and identify which one of them is beefy or gin. Not just gin, but specifically beefy or gin. Um, and we'll go through that entire process. We also start around the, the back third of training to start introducing you into bar management processes, right? So you'll help with inventory, right? So you'll come in and whoever the manager is that's responsible, for maintaining inventory at that point in time. You'll help them with the count, and that person will teach you those things, right? Once you've accomplished enough to understand that step, then you'll get that, that stage passed and signed off, right? Um, that includes also cocktail costs, because we're helping you do cocktail development at the same time. So initially we do something like, we need you to do three twists on classic cocktails, okay? Just simple twists, but like they've gotta follow like a basic Tom Collins structure, right? So infuse the spirit, like do a flavored syrup, some fancy soda on top, just three basic things that show us that you understand how we can take classic cocktails as a foundation and then morph them in to more updated drinks, right? And then we want to see an original cocktail that necessarily isn't tied as closely to a classic, but we need to get that cocktail cost and out, right? So we want you to submit a sheet that says how much your cocktail costs so that you understand these concepts. Right? Where would it fit on the menu? It would go in slot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You understand that each of those slots has a different specific function when we create the menu because you sit in meetings with us every single week where you, you talk about menu creation and menu development, right? And all of these different things that are components to like how all of us work as bar managers now are part of our training because we can't have someone that's working behind the bar and trying to participate in the development of our cocktail program not understand these basic fundamentals every single week when they come to the bar. Right? We could have just stopped short at recipes, you're capable of making drinks, you understand cash procedures, right? But for us, we need our staff to be collectively on the entire, on the same page if we're going to have them contribute to a cocktail menu as, as a whole, which is really the goal for all of us, right? It's why these people are interested in working in these bars, is because they would like to make their own drinks and contribute. How many of you have worked in a position where you were a bartender and then someone made, made all the cocktails and you just put them out, right? It, it takes away from like, the rationale for why you decided to work in a specific bar. So we're trying to get that development together as a team, okay? Um, and then we've got different readings, and then we have a celebration at the end for the public, okay? And this is basically our program. If you'd like me to send you like the actual itemized 12 stages, then you can certainly do that. Uh, we give people raises throughout this process as well. So initially we start off with a very low wage where you're not making as much money as the rest of the bartenders. And then we also then allow you to work behind the bar, right? Where you've got a manager working directly behind you, right? And that manager helps you work through the shifts. We like to schedule this on Fridays and Saturdays. And while you're working in that position, we pay you a wage that's similar to what you would be making as a bartender, right? But aren't because you're not capable of contributing to the tip pool. And then when you get past that point, then you're able to work into the tip pool. So we protect the rest of the staff during that period. Right, but also we compensate you similarly to what you would be compensated at in the future so that you're working in the bar and you're happy with your decision. And we can take that first month, right, to develop you fully before we put you in the tip pool, which is expensive, right? And it's hard to justify spending that much money on training, but it's necessary if you don't want to create a balance that your staff then has to inherit, right? We, we desperately need someone to work so and so quick unexpectedly. We're going to throw you in right now and the tip is gonna suffer and you're gonna to have to carry the blood of the load of the person who's been working here for four years, right? It's not ethical. It's just not, right? You're, you're disproportionately affecting someone's tips and income, right? Because you haven't developed a training program that fully supports that transition, right? So we don't believe in it. 
All right, so this is what the blind 50 test looks like for us. So basically, this changes all the time, and it's basically the 50 most common spirits or liqueurs that we're pouring in the well from that cocktail menu, right? So if you don't pass the blind 50 taste test before we change the cocktail menu seasonally, that means you might have to do it all over again, right? And you have to get 48 out of 50 to pass, okay? Um, some people nail this right away. Like we had someone recently that was like, first time knock it out. And we're like, all right, you come here, you go down, it's okay. Um, other people have taken like a lot longer, right? And when that happens, the staff frequently helps to support that person in trying to figure out what they're doing wrong. And we'll sit down and taste with them and go through different categories. They usually tend to struggle with one category over the other, right? So it's like, you're messing your rums up. I don't know why, but like, let's sit down and talk about it. We'll do the rum taste test together again and try and figure out what the differences are here. And I think that that process is really important, right? Because we need everybody to be invested in this person's development. When we hire people, we tend to hire people for fit more so than who's the most qualified person at the time. So the most recent person that we hired at Anvil is Corey. Corey used to work at Nightingale. Corey's really young, he's like 22 years old, right? And he's a puppy, because we needed a puppy. Because puppies unite the staff. They bring everybody together and everybody comes, becomes really invested in who they're going to be in the future, right? Everybody kind of acts right because they don't want to set a bad example, right? And they help them through training because they're excited about showing them the things that they've learned at this point in time in their career. And training becomes more collaborative in that sense. This is really, really important that when you're developing training programs, you create things that exist in that training program where someone can ask for help with their other staff members so that person has a chance to become a mentor to that person without being a manager, right? Which is really important because sometimes you need to talk to someone who's not your boss, right? But it's also really important because that person who then is moving into the mentor role is now being trained on how to become a manager themselves. Because again, training should never end. Right? So we need to create these intersections for our staff members to help one another out in an educational manner so that that person has a chance to develop and to acquire leadership skills without having the title passed on to them. Because that's important before you acquire that title to be able to do those things. So for us, the blind taste test is really important because we want our staff to certainly know a lot about spirits and we pride them on like how intimately, they, they, intimately familiar they are with their back bar. But I think the more important component here is that we've created something in the training program that forces people together and forces them to talk to one another and to respect each other in different positions. The last thing we do in our training program is that we make you make all 100 classic cocktails on the list to a public for, for the public for a dollar each. We take the menu, we tape it to the bar top, we put a Sharpie marker down, right? And when someone orders a cocktail, they mark that cocktail off and you have to make all 100 cocktails for guests by memory, right? Which everybody should be able to do at this point because they've been bartending for about six months or so, depending on how quickly they move through the stages, right? But it's a celebration for that person ending training. And when we do it, like all the regulars in the bar show up, right? We do this like line down the block. I don't know why, but people wait two hours to get a cocktail for a dollar. It makes no sense to me when they do it, right? And it's a lot of fun. And, and then we take that person out and get them really drunk. Right? Um, but this is just something that we do, so there's this goal at the end, this moment of celebration, right? And then as soon as that day is over, we tell them that they're now responsible for other things, and they start a whole new level of training. So after they, after they pass this 12-stage this training program, they then inherit something that they're responsible for every week. It could be dry goods ordering, it could be liquor ordering, it could be production, it could be scheduling. Whatever, they inherit these different components, right? And then everybody gets past training, when they kind of get stacked in those roles, we rotate everybody so that everybody learns a different part of that process, okay? And then ideally, when you've finished rotating through all those processes, we have a manager slot open, right? Or you move on to another bar, we're very happy for you, right? But it never stops, and it's always structured. And I don't know why someone would come work at our bar if that's not something they're interested in, right? And that, that meeting of their expectations for us as an employer and what we're providing them and doing it in an organized and structured way is a big reason why people come work for us. So now back to more of the advanced goals, right? which is really the, the part of training that, that's hard to write down on paper that people don't talk about. Okay? Make time to discuss the grades. All right, we do regular staff meetings every single week in every single one of our bars, okay? We write down every single component of operational costs on an Excel sheet. If you finish training, right, 
you're responsible for different elements of the sheet, right? So you're like, all right, guys, I did liquor cost this week. This is what our liquor cost was. Somebody else is like, all right, this is what it cost, uh, what labor cost was this week, right? Including all of the taxes associated with tip income and everything associated with that, right? This is also what we did as a percentage uh, of sales for tips this week, right? And we have standards for evaluating that as well. Guys, we, we made 21% in tips across the board for the entire week. That's really not what we'd like to see. And it's really one of the only statistics that we have to measure how service went that week. Was there something happening? Were there people out of town? Did we get like flooded by like a rocket game when tips are typically slower? Okay, great, we did. We got flooded by a rocket game. Why didn't why wasn't the schedule corrected for that? And we talk about all of these things in a really transparent manner. Those are usually conversations that occur directly between an owner and a manager. We almost intentionally save those conversations every single week, specifically for our meetings as a staff so that everybody understands the decisions that are being made at the bar. Me and Terry are going to talk about those things anyways, right? We save them and talk about them on Tuesdays at one o'clock, right? In the presence of everyone so that everyone understands the decisions that we're trying to make. Because they might save us in the future. They may be like, hey, did you hear there's a Justin Timberlake con or, uh, concert downtown? Right? We're kind of short on Tuesday. We can use one person. Right? If we don't have that conversation as a group, they're not going to catch those things. And they're also not going to really understand the decisions that we're making. Okay? We talk about problems from the week. Right? One problem that we're having at Anvil currently, right? We'll just keep using Anvil as an example. One problem that we're having at Anvil currently is that we've had a lot of break ins into parked cars. Right? I don't know if you've been to Houston, but there's no mass transit, it just doesn't exist. Right? And so people are parking their vehicles outside, leaving laptops in their cars because they're not from the city, and we probably have two or three cars broken into every single night. Right? We talk about this, how would we handle it as a staff, right? and we need people to talk about that specific problem so that we can focus on that issue, figure out what we're going to do, are we going to hire a security person, how frequently is it going to happen, how do you talk to guests when this occurs, and we discuss this problem every week, but it could really be anything. Right? We try and save those conversations specifically for the meeting, and the staff knows that. We'll communicate via Slack, or via text message, or someone will tell their manager. Right? In this meeting specifically, everybody knows we're supposed to bring all the problems from the week to talk about as a group, because the three of us who worked that shift, understanding what the solution was, is still important to the other four people that didn't. Okay? And then we always encourage feedback from the staff. Pre and post shift discussions. Specifically, things that we're dealing with you know, when we're, we're trying to get someone to improve in a certain area. It's really important that managers be there to talk to that person specifically before the shift starts about what their goals are for that shift and then evaluate those goals with that person afterwards, right? It doesn't always have to be a manager too. It can just be a senior staff member, right? Where I'm walking in and I'm like, hey, Jonathan, we really need Corey to work on this today, okay? So just keep, make sure that we're really focusing on, on that throughout the shift, right? And then Jonathan, when the shift is over, make sure that you give some feedback to Corey about what he could have done different so that he can improve in that manner. That conversation as an owner takes you 15 seconds, and I promise it will totally change how the shift works, right? But it has to be deliberated, and it has to be structured, and it has to be part of the shift. Make bar decisions as a group. So there are some things that I would like to do with some of our bars right now, right? At different bars, I would like to increase some of our prices because our rent is going up at some of the bars. And other bars, we just started doing brunch, right? And so there's a decision about do we need to hire one more bartender to work two more shifts that were open? How does that other person then get those other two shifts, right? And these are all things that, again, would be conversations that happen about your bar where management and ownership typically makes a decision and then they tell the staff how it's going to work. Right? Have those discussions as a group. Right? When we talk about prices, we're like, hey, we think we're going to need to raise prices. We've got to offset these rent costs. Can everybody come to the meeting next week with 10 cocktails that they think you would feel comfortable charging a dollar more for? Right? Because these are the people that are ultimately going to have to deliver this message. Right? Also, think about how much ethos there is in that conversation. When we talk about pricing, we don't talk about what we could charge for cocktails, which I think is how most people handle pricing. That's a whole other similar, right? But when we talk about pricing, we talk about what we need to, to charge for our cocktails, right? And what we feel comfortable charging guests for those drinks, which is a conversation about guest expectations. It's a conversation about how we treat our guests, that we don't treat them as ATMs, right? That we want the experience that people have in our bars to be something that can be a regular component in their life. These are all things that I think different owners value, right? And they're, they're the reason why we've chosen to make our bars the way they are. And they're the reason why 
you know, we've, we've decided on this bar versus like this super high end bar, but we never tell our staff that. We just hire them and then we hope that they like the space that we've created and then we allow them to work in it, right? But we don't discuss these decisions enough in really direct ways so that they understand the values of who we are as employers and why we specifically chose to create that bar that we now have. The same thing with scheduling. Do you guys want to hire another person for brunch or would you like to pick up the two shifts weekly, right? Or dilute the number of available shifts by hiring another person? It doesn't matter to me as long as our standards for service don't change, right? But we would like you to make the decision. It's a much better approach than we've hired another person, there's going to be two less shifts available each week. We also encourage our staff to support colleagues in the industry. So this is specifically focused on different events and talking about what events are happening every single week. Right? We need them to have experiences outside of our bar to keep them informed about who they might be potentially. This is really important because I, I feel like our program and who I am as a person and a lot of our managers as well are very strong people that are like, this is specifically how this needs to be handled at all times. Right? I, I'm certainly that person. Right? But it's, it's, it's important for them to go out and have experiences where people introduce them to other concepts, other ideas, and other approaches. Because often they come back with, why? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do this thing? Right? And those conversations are really